Thank you very much, Ben, and my thanks to the RSA for hosting this event. Uh, I don't know about you, but I pick up heroes through my life, and uh, uh, Rodney Marsh, the great Queen's Park Rangers player before he went to Manchester City, Paul McCartney, uh, Ernest Bevin, uh, Ben Lucas, and Matthew Taylor, obviously. <laughs> but you pick up new heroes in your different ministerial portfolios, and one of the first things I did as Secretary of State for Health was commemorate the 150th anniversary of the death of uh, virtually the founder of the science of epidemiology, John Snow. And John Snow was an amazing character. He was born the son of a labourer in York and uh, became an apprentice surgeon at the age of 14. But it was John Snow who, during an outbreak of cholera in the mid-19th century in London, in Soho, located what was happening to a pump in what was then Broad Street, now Broadwick Street, in Soho. And at the time, the view was that cholera was caused by something in the air, the miasma, uh, they called it. And he felt that it was coming from the water supply. And he was so convinced that in the end, he took the simple and direct action of unscrewing the handle of the pump and the levels of cholera reduced dramatically. It reminded me of that Bob Dylan's line in Subterranean Homesick Blues, the pump don't work because the vandals took the handle. And so, uh, but, but it was also direct political action uh, associated with public health. And from then onwards, I mean, he died, Snow died before seeing this all come to fruition, but that led directly to Basil Getty's proposals to improve London's sewers. And that legislation in the 19th century uh, really epitomized the term public health, which referred to measures to improve sanitation in the country's great industrial cities. Along with the 1911 National Insurance Act, it was one of the few major interventions that the state made on behalf of the health and well-being of the working poor before the inception of the National Health Service. In the 20th century, advances in medicine provided unprecedented opportunities to improve both the detection and prevention of disease. And it was the National Health Service which made these advances available to everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. And it's not a new idea to say that the NHS should focus on prevention. Its aim has historically been to prevent illness as effectively as it treats it. That's why it wasn't called the National Illness Service. But despite this objective, public health and prevention have frequently played second fiddle. In the 80s and 90s, the NHS barely had the resources to treat poor health, let alone promote good health. Greatly increased investment has transformed the landscape so that these important elements have become central to our health reforms. The Health England report published today shows that in 1999, this country spent only 1.8% of its total health expenditure on prevention and public health. We now spend over 3.6%, double what was spent in 1999 and comfortably above the OECD average of 2.9%. So it's a bigger slice of a much bigger cake. I remind you that in 1997, we spent around 400 pounds per head of population on health. Next year, we will spend 1,600 pounds per head of population. And this was entirely justified and necessary because the majority of poor health in this country cannot be attributed to infectious disease anymore, but to heart problems, stroke, and cancer, conditions that to a large extent are exacerbated by poor diet and lack of exercise and are therefore preventable. As GPs and practice nurses who deal with thousands of patients with long-term conditions have known for many years, the illnesses their patients present with had their genesis several decades before. Poverty, poor education, and poor aspiration 
exert as much, if not greater, influence over people's health and well-being as genetics. And too often, such determinants are passed down from generation to generation as if they were hereditary. Since 1997, our priority has been to improve preventative care and address the wider social determinants of poor health. And there have been some notable and hard-won successes. Smoking rates have reduced by nearly a quarter in the last 12 years, falling fastest amongst routine and, annual, uh, and manual classes. Rates of death caused by alcohol are beginning to level off, and there are very early signs that we are halting the seemingly relentless rise in childhood obesity. And we are making some progress on health inequality. The health and well-being amongst the most disadvantaged is now at the same level that the, rest of the, pop that the health of the rest of the population was eight years ago when we began uh, this strategy. If the health of all sections in our community hadn't improved as well, we're glad about that, our policy is not to kill the middle classes. We're glad that the health of every social class has improved. But if, if that hadn't happened, then we wouldn't have just narrowed the health inequality gap. We would have closed it completely. The major killers, stroke, cancer, heart disease, cannot be vaccinated against in the same way that it was possible to greatly reduce the threat of infectious disease in the middle of the last century. They are determined by lifestyle diseases such as obesity, which in turn are determined by the day-to-day -day decisions that people make that affect their health. So this raises serious questions about what role a responsible government should play in determining how people live their lives, and in particular, the decisions they make about their health. Some claim that poor health is a matter of poor choice, that, that if it is all down to what people eat, smoke, drink and how much exercise they take, then it is purely the responsibility of individuals to moderate their behavior. But as the Foresight Report points out, while obesity is a product of the simple equation, we eat too much and don't move enough, the factors that lead to it are infinitely more complex. The, emin the eminent scientists and academics at Foresight don't use the term obesogenic environment lightly. They use it because their internationally renowned research shows that the way in which communities are designed and how we live and work actively conspires against our health and in many cases overrides personal choice. For example, long working hours combined with caring responsibilities require an her her Herculean effort to regularly exercise half an hour, five times a week, as recommended by the Chief Medical Officer and the British Heart Foundation. The causes of poor health are not so much about the choices people make, but the choices they are able to make. And it's those living in the most deprived communities whose choices are limited the most. They inhabit the most dilapidated public spaces, they're cut off by poor public transport links, and they are served by the worst performing schools. They are more likely to smoke, to drink too much, and to have the most unhealthy diet, and invariably they live shorter lives. In a speech in Glasgow last July, David Cameron said that being poor and eating badly were the consequences of the choices that people make. It's a nonsense to claim that anyone actively chooses poverty or poor health. Those living in the most deprived parts of Manchester, London and Glasgow do not choose to die 6, 11 or even 28 years earlier than their more prosperous neighbours. No responsible government can morally justify a retreat to the touchline to be mere spectators as the waistline of the nation expands, lives get shorter and deprivation intensifies. No responsible government should shy away from the predictable and tedious accusation that any government seeking to improve the nation's health is impersonating the behavior of a female goat. Those who cry nanny state at the merest suggestion that we should change our behavior trivialize a debate that is critical to the future well-being of this country. Public health issues can no more be ignored now 
than in the 19th century, when many, many politicians opposed the great public health reforms designed to improve living conditions in London's slums until the stench from Soho hung over the House of Commons terrace and the death toll from cholera ran to tens of thousands. But it is right to question precisely what the government's role should be. In enabling people to make better choices about their health and in tackling the most intractable health problems, in particular obesity, we need to consider whether we've done enough, whether our approach is the right one and what further action we need to take. The issues around lifestyle diseases are deeply complex, where socio socioeconomic factors fuse with matters of psychology, family and community. Any approach by government clearly must reflect this complexity, not seek to deflect it by placing all responsibility in the hands of the individual or relying on dictatorial interventions. In a speech commemorating the centenary of the first Public Health Act of 1848, Nye Bevan said that when politicians become aware of a public health risk, they have a duty to act, whether that's poor sanitation in the 19th century, smoking in the 20th century, or obesity in the 21st century, that duty still remains. But the way in which they act, must depend both on the issue and the level of public awareness and engagement. In that same speech, Bevan said a remarkably prescient thing. He said, and I quote, no social reform can come to fruition until public opinion accepts or is induced to tolerate that reform. It is here that the politician becomes essential to give form to the idea, to modify it, if necessary, in such a way as to make it acceptable to the many interests affected. So, on the most interventionist and in some circles controversial level, there are some circumstances where it's clearly appropriate for the government to legislate or regulate to promote better health. Banning advertising, restrictions on the promotion of cigarettes and smoke-free legislation have undoubtedly helped reduce the number of smokers and, as a consequence, save lives. But today, the consequences of smoking are widely understood, even by the most hardened of smokers. And very few people would ever want to see a return of smoking in bars, restaurants, train stations, and even, as clinic clinicians tell me, in operating theatres. The, anaes the anaesthetists used to have the ashtray and the fag whilst they monitored the uh, patient. Uh, believe it or not, uh, it was absolutely the case. And of course, when Bevan spoke in 1948, the great breakthrough by Hill and Dole, helped by the NHS and the Medical Research Council in the 1950s, hadn't made that link between smoking and lung cancer. So Bevan was absolutely right. The restrictions we've introduced would have been totally unacceptable 40 or 50 years ago, when while it was accepted by many scientists that smoking was harmful, there was limited awareness amongst the public of the catastrophic impact that smoking has on health. It's too great a leap to assume that what works today for smoking will also work for obesity or for that matter, alcohol. The chief medical officer was right to start a debate about whether there should be a minimum unit price for alcohol, given all we know about the harm that excessive drinking can cause. But it's an idea that needs to be considered very carefully. In a tough economic climate, is it really right to penalise moderate drinkers? It presents genuine difficulty for policymakers balancing public health demands with economic realities and the concerns of the public. If legislation and regulation are not always the answer, what about incentives and disin disincentives that to use the current or to be more accurate uh, last year's political parlance nudge people to change their behaviour? The Foresight Report on Obesity examined the fact that often the communities in which we live do more to encourage unhealthy choices than actively promote good health. For many people, it's comparatively easy to drive to work and extremely difficult to cycle. And not everyone is able to defer the instant gratification of that one cigarette or glass of vodka or meat pie too many in favour of longer-term 
health benefits. There are different ways that incentives can work. We can improve the physical environment. Councils can create cycle routes and safe green spaces as well as sponsoring walk-to-school schemes. But is, is there anything more that government can do to make sure that health and well-being is a priority in the planning and development of public spaces? Every time a local council sits down to consider a planning application for a new development, such as an out-of-town shopping centre, we need them to be asking tough questions about the impact that any new development will have on people's health and well-being. Will it actively encourage people to be more physically active, to eat better, or will it just make it more convenient for people to climb into their cars and load up their trolleys? It's these issues that need to be considered at every planning meeting across the country. In the same vein, employers can play an important role by incentivizing physical activity, by providing better facilities and flexible working arrangements for their staff. But while these incentives will work for some, they won't work for all. There will always be some people who will be immune to these opportunities because they don't see exercise as something that they or people like them do or because the messages they get from their peers are much more influential. That's why we must also look at mentoring schemes such as health trainer schemes where primary care trusts recruit people from disadvantaged communities to give health advice to people in those communities, setting goals on reducing smoking and increasing physical activity. Again, it's possible to go further still. The report by Health England today explores the role that financial incentives can play in changing people's behaviour, whether that's by stopping them smoking or losing weight. Some primary care trusts are already looking at this. Eastern and Coastal Kent PCT is trialling a financial incentive schemes, scheme for, to encourage weight loss. And some of the Healthy Towns initiatives are building incentives into their programmes, such as Manchester's Points for Life scheme. We look forward to hearing about the evaluation of these schemes in the near future. The final and least interventionist level is the provision of information and advice. The campaigns on smoking and obesity are highly sophisticated in their targeting and their understanding of the factors that motivate people to change. The smoking campaigns funded by the Department of Health have been widely acclaimed by marketing experts in both the public and private sector. But however sophisticated they are, they can't work on their own. And while it's very easy to point out the pitfalls of smoking, which are now widely understood, Advertising cannot promote positive behavioural change on its own. There's arguably little difference between telling people to exercise more and those hopeful public information films on health from the 1940s, which advised people to sit up straight at work, not to do the ironing immediately before bedtime, and to avoid wearing shoes or socks that are too tight. This is why Change for Life is much more than a collection of slick adverts. It's rooted in research about people's behaviours and how they live their lives. It tells people how they can make positive changes as well as warning of the dangers of obesity. Critically, it's not just a government campaign. Indeed, you won't see any reference to the government on any of the advertisements. It's a partnership between commu community and voluntary groups, retailers, industry, schools and the National Health Service. The complexity of the public health issues inevitably means that some of these things will work for some of the people some of the time. The role of government, the, the health service and policy makers is to ascertain what can work best and when. The underlying difficulty is that we are not just dealing with a collection of issues, alcoholism, obesity, smoking. We're dealing with people their personal motivations, their family circumstances, and their self-esteem. There are cultural and social dimensions to public health and health promotion that we must seek to understand better. Heavy drinking is not by any means a problem that's limited to this country's high streets on a Saturday night. While we rightly worry about antisocial and even violent, violent behaviour caused by excessive consumption, 
The drinking culture is endemic in almost every aspect of British life. Non-drinkers are often subjected to the same disdain that non-smokers were 30 or 40 years ago. People looked at you strangely if you refused a cigarette. I remember it. You got on a, you went on the London Underground. There was one carriage for people who didn't smoke. And everyone looked at them as if they were rather eccentric individuals as they shuffled in. So the, uh, people who don't drink are the odd ones out at the office party, watching the football in the pub at the family celebration. The question we must ask, not so much as a government but as a society, is why, unlike smoking, is it the abstainers that draw people's attention, not those who regularly drink their weekly limit in a day? The question of how we transform culture is not one we can necessarily answer. People often talk whimsically about how nice it would be to transform drinking culture here into the much idealized cafe culture of Southern Europe. But we can't press any magic button to make that happen because the factors that make us who we are are infinitely more complex. And in any case, there are more signs that Southern Europeans are being influenced by binge drinking than that we are turning into a nation of Mediterranean wine sippers. If we want to make further progress, these cultural questions must be addressed. I believe that now is the right time to consider how we can best learn from the past and the present and what more we should consider for the future. Over the next few months, I want us to look at what the future of public health policy should look like and in particular to identify specifically where information and campaigning can work what incentives can really influence behaviour and where it might be appropriate for the state to legislate or regulate to promote further change. This is necessary because public health is a policy issue that's unique in its diversity and its complexity. There is no clear set of rules or levers that will work for every situation because it is fundamentally about how we live and who we are. It's comparatively, and I stress comparatively, easy to improve hospitals, schools, and the other public services that are represented by buildings and institutions. It's a different matter when confronted with such intangibles as what motivates people to change. Yet it's on examining such intangibles that future gains in life expectancy, in particular healthy life expectancy, depend. Government not only has a responsibility to act, Government has a duty to confront this complexity because it is essential to making meaningful change to the health, well-being and future prosperity of this country and its people. Okay, I'd like, now like to introduce uh, Matthew Taylor, uh, the Chief Executive of the RSA, to respond. Thanks, Ben. I'll be very brief and um, just like uh, to start by congratulating Alan on uh, a speech which was, I think, remarkably jargon-free and clear, uh, and also very unusually for ministerial speech, actually under time, uh, um, which is uh, giving us more time for, for, for questions. So I will follow that and be very brief. I can't resist, however, Alan, starting with an anecdote. Um, 25 years ago, I had a car accident. If you look very closely at my forehead, you can still see a scar, and I was taken to... Um, I think it might even have been called the casualty at uh, Stratford uh, Hospital, which was, uh, and what I remember, it was, it was basically like a front room, um, and it had an old-fashioned gas fire in it. And uh, when you, uh, your forehead, I mean, it's still the case, but you have to have an anaesthetic injected straight into the wound, which is quite, kind of terrifying. And so as I lay there realising that this was going to happen to me, the nurse, I remember this very distinctively, she was a kind of, um, uh, a kind of grandmotherly Irish woman, uh, she could see my terror, and so she took the untipped senior service. For those of you who are under the age of 40, that's a cigarette. Uh, she took the untipped senior service that she was smoking and gave me a drag on it. Uh, um, the really awful thing about that story is it worked. Um, but but I, um, I'm not suggesting we go back to those days. Now, uh, I, I just want to make uh, four, four, four very quick points. The first is that... that uh, uh, I'm impressed by um, the focus on uh, public health. Um, I think what's happened is um, 
uh, two things have happened together, really. Firstly, that as the kind of most pressing problems around the NHS as an organization uh, have been, uh, have, as progress has been made on them, as we've moved from a situation in which the NHS seems to be perpetu perpetually in crisis, it's enabled um, ministers to look more closely at public health. Um, and also, I think, as Alan has suggested, the, the, the insight and knowledge we now have into what works in relation to uh, supporting people, in relation to social marketing campaigns, means that it feels that public health is more of a science than perhaps uh, it used to be. But my first point is simply that we're, it's going to take real determination to ensure that we defend public health spending uh, when money becomes much tighter in the health service, as it inevitably will over the next few years. Um, so I hope that the proportion that you've described, the growing proportion of that budget, can be defended uh, when things um, tighten up. The second point to make is that I think that... Um, uh, Whilst public health is clearly a, an area in itself, uh, I think it's important to draw a parallels or to recognise the continuity between the argument, the conversation that we need to have with people about responsibility for healthcare, with the debate that we need to have also about empowering forms of healthcare. Um, uh, it's increasingly the case um, that in relation to people with long-term chronic conditions, that the idea that patients are in control of their treatment, make choices about their treatment. Uh, Alan, you'll be no doubt involved in thinking through how exactly the government implements its commitment to develop individual budgets of people with long-term health conditions, which is a really tricky policy problem. So it seems to me that there is a, a broader message which links um, responsibility for one's own health with the idea of patients themselves taking responsibility and being empowered in their care, particularly when they're people with long-term conditions. Um, the third point I wanted to make was um, uh, about... Uh, uh, the emphasis that you put on uh, inequality uh, in your speech, Alan. Um, and we've had here at the RSA a number of very interesting conversations about inequality in recent weeks, and particularly important was uh, the book uh, The Spirit Level by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, which I'm sure you've come across, which I think argues really without um, uh, much doubt that in the richest countries, and it is only the richest countries, the kind of top 20 countries in the world, uh, that there is a, a strong correlation between uh, high levels of inequality and a variety of social pathologies, including um, poor public health and uh, poor mental health. Uh, and the reason I make that point is that I think that whilst it's commendable that you and the Ed Balls in education have a commitment to reducing inequalities in public services, I don't think we should ever kid ourselves that the strategies that we adopt in public services can compensate for the broader social context. And so I think the conversation that we need to have is not just about what can we do in health to promote equality, it is what is the kind of society that most promotes well-being overall. Um, and that's not simply, I'd like to say, a kind of left-wing point. One of the things I've argued in my blog is that I think the evidence about the, 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 the impact of high levels of inequality on well-being is so strong that it would be good if that was an area for kind of national consensus, and then we can have a debate about how best it is that you tackle inequality. And there may be big state solutions and small state solutions, left of centre solutions, right of centre solutions. But I think it's important that we, we have that debate about what is a well-being society. And then the final point I wanted to make, which is a kind of, um, I guess, a, a hobby horse of my own, which is that a, a lot of consideration is given to uh, the literature around social marketing and books like Nudge, but I still think there's a, there's a problem, and, and it's a difficult policy problem. And, and that is that I think one of the things that you would derive from this literature is that there is a kind of, you know, a kind of quantum theory of messages, which is there are only so many messages that people can hear and absorb. Um, and I think that in both your area, and also I'd say in the area of sustainability and climate change, people feel overwhelmed with messages. Um, you know, that they hear about their five a day, they hear about the need to be fit, they hear about smoking, they hear about alcohol, uh, hear about obesity. And not only are there, is there a plethora of national messages, but also then that's reinforced by local campaigns. So you get on a bus in any particular city and the local authority has got its own health campaigns. And so I think a real challenge is, is to ask whether or not uh, there is a case 
for um, agreeing single national priorities, which may be well locally delivered, will we really get over a particular message very, very powerfully? And I wonder whether we might make further, may, may, might make more progress. If we were to say, look, we are going to focus on, I don't know, obesity and only obesity for the next two or three years, and re really try and crack this in order that everybody in the country understands this is what we're talking about, and that you get a kind of sense of national mobilisation. Now, I can see the problems with that because that suggests relegating the importance of other issues, and it also suggests a rather centralised approach. But I do think there's a problem if we're following the literature about the fact that the literature would tell us that too many messages become counterproductive, and I think that that is something which ordinary citizens are, are subject to.